Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool every single day. Oops, I got the uh, volume up on my iPad. Sorry about that. Hope you guys are having an incredible Friday. It is the weekend. Oh, I've got my phone volume up too. Uh, volume everywhere. Uh, hope you guys are ready for an incredible weekend. Summer is basically starting, at least in Vancouver. Beautiful sunny day today. And sorry that we uh, started a little bit, like a couple minutes past one uh, for our live show. We shot our very first uh, 4K uh, video game review today. And so it took a little while to process all of that stuff. You're going to be able to watch it. Not in 4K in the stream, but uh, you'll be able to watch the 4K uh, video of that later today, which is uh, exciting for us. Took a little longer to process all of that though. Uh, but let's get started with our rundown. Our rundown today is going out to King Xanadu and he says, this, this blew me away when I read this yesterday. Vic, you're easily the best gaming interviewer on earth and he was commenting on uh, the Nino Kuni 2 interview that we did yesterday. You are a sweetheart, King Xanadu, if that's in fact your real name. But we got you this rundown. After a string of disappointments, DC is hoping for their movie universe that can be saved by a god or new gods. The studio is developing a big screen movie based on the iconic New, god, new Gods comic series. First published in 1971, the books see a group of powerful aliens led by the villainous Darkseid come to Earth in order to wage war. The books were created by Jack Kirby, best known for co-creating Marvel characters like Hulk, Fantastic Four, and X-Men, and Kirby injected loads of social commentary and heady sci-fi themes into the stories. As for who will make the film, DC and Warner Brothers are in talks with Selma and, add a, uh, and a Wrinkle in Time director, Ava DuVernay, to direct, and she's obviously no stranger to social commentary. A release window hasn't been named. Now, I haven't seen A Wrinkle in Time. We were uh, supposed to go out and see it. We, we screwed up scheduling wise and didn't get to it uh, but it looked like it could be sort of approximating uh, you know the vibe of a superhero movie um, I'm excited that we've got you know different visions and different ideas I think this is a very cool thing I think uh, it, you know obviously we need to have some different voices in this uh, this superhero pool like this I have to admit I'm not super familiar with the new gods this makes me want to go and read all of those stories so uh, I probably will be picking up some of those things and, and checking them out on my giant iPad uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is fantastic news. It's uh, it's clear that DC isn't giving up and they're not shying away from stuff that isn't, you know, maybe so overtly well known there. It's not just going to be Batman movies and Batman family movies. It's a big deal that they're going to make a new Gods flick. It's also a big deal that they're currently in production on Shazam, which, uh, you know, they're, they're playing with a lot of this territory. Thor and Doctor Strange have basically, and Black Panther, have opened the doors to superhero movies of all shapes and sizes and, you know, backgrounds, all kinds of cool stuff. So, psyched about this. Also psyched that the biggest esports event in the world is leaving the U.S. and coming to Canada. Valve has announced that their annual Dota 2 tournament, the International, is leaving its home city of Seattle and will instead be held in EP's hometown of Vancouver. This is the first time the event will take place on Canadian soil and Valve hasn't said why they're moving the event, although it's worth pointing out that it will be easier for competitors from around the globe to secure travel visas to Canada than it would be to the United States. The International 2018 takes place from August 20th to August 25th and will be, he be held in Vancouver Rogers Arena. Tickets go on sale next week. Yeah, this is a big deal and I'm currently um, experiencing this because I'm friends with uh, Rami Ismail on uh, um, uh, Facebook and he's, uh, you know, uh, based in uh, Copenhagen, I believe, uh, but he's he's got a Middle Eastern descent and a Middle Eastern name, uh, and he's also done a lot of great things in the uh, the video game space. Uh, he's a prolific indie developer, and he's been putting together uh, a talk at GDC with lots of other developers from all kinds of nationalities, and some of those folks have had their travel visas uh, stopped, and so he has had to con continually and continuously change the speakers that are going to be at his talk at GDC next week, which is ludicrous. These are professionals that are working in the gaming space, but yes, they're having a very tough time um, just getting access to be able to, you know, talk about their profession in America right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is the beginning of several other things related to what, you know, we're all into, games and entertainment and all that stuff, uh, you know, come up and, and uh, be located here in Canada. We used to have a, a GDC Canada, um, and uh, I think this is going to be the beginning of some very, very big things. We've also had, uh, what's, what's the effects 
show, the uh, the big special effects, visual effects show. I forget the name of it. We've had we've had those guys come up and and um, yeah, and be based up here in uh, in Vancouver. Ted has had uh, uh, be, you know been headquartered in Vancouver. I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing, which is a little bit sad, but. Uh, you know, it's kind of the way of the world right now for people trying to get to work in uh, in the U.S. right now, which is crazy. Uh, let's talk about Battlefront 2 news. Electronic Arts and DICE are revamping Star Wars Battlefront 2 yet again, but it might be a little too late. They've announced a complete overhaul of the progression system in the game, changing it from a randomized process to something more straightforward and linear. For starters, players will no longer need to sift through loot crates in order to get the star cards they need to un uh, that they need to unlock new abilities. They'll instead be able to unlock specific star cards using experience points. This will take away the randomization process Process, which means a lot less grinding. As for microtransactions, they'll still be in the game, but you won't be able to use them to buy loot crates, which was the biggest cause of all the controversy surrounding the game. It remains to be seen if these changes will help win back players given the bad reputation that the game already has. The changes begin rolling out next week. I was just thinking about this game. I, uh, I loaded up a, a, a game on my Xbox, which I'll be talking about a little bit later in the show, and uh, I saw my Battlefront 2 icon just sitting right there, and I'm like, is anybody still playing this thing? I, I want to go back into it. I think uh, I, I loved it when I was playing it, and I, I feel like you know, maybe some of the backlash for this game and also some of the uh, divisiveness of The Last Jedi has kind of taken the wind out of the sails. But listen, man, like Dice and Criteria and, the pe and Motive, the people that built that game, they built something really beautiful. It has lots of issues and it's pissed a lot of people off. But, uh, you know, if you're a Star Wars fanatic like I am, there was a lot of joy to be had in that experience. And, you know, hopefully this brings people back. The other thing that they've announced with all of these changes is that a lot more content is coming, and Solo, of course, is going to be launching next month, or in a month and a half. Um, you know, there's new Star Wars content headed our way. There'll probably be announcements of, uh, you know, the, w what the Star Wars TV show looks like, maybe some kind of reveal about the animated stuff that's headed our way. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be added to Star Wars Battlefront 2. Uh, let's see. This is going to be a very interesting summer, and... Uh, I mean, this is a big lesson that not only EA has learned, but the, the entire video game industry has learned. I, I do still want to play the game. I, I've had a lot of fun in Star Wars Battlefront 2, you know, and I, I may be alone in that uh, that comment, but I've really enjoyed a lot of stuff about Battlefront 2. Uh, my review went up and, and uh, I, it was from the heart. I played hours and hours and hours of it, uh, but I fully understand all of the... Uh, uh, all of the anger and all of the stuff that has come out of this and it hopefully it leads to very good things uh, across the industry and lots of big changes I mean one of the biggest ones is just just make it uh, uh, you know so it, it, it's uh, it, it's not based on uh, powering your characters up it's just cosmetic you know just make it about the look and feel of your characters anyways Western gamers will soon be able to win a chicken dinner on their phones. The mobile version of Battlegrounds, which was first released in China late last year, is coming to the West. A beta version is currently available on Android devices in Canada, and a full release on both iOS and Android will hit all of North America and Europe soon. The mobile version wasn't a straight-up port. It's instead uh, built from the ground up for mobile devices, but is meant to be faithful to the main game. The announcement of the Western release comes just days after rival game Fortnite Battle Royale began rolling out its own mobile version. This is crazy days, man. We're going to see cross-platform play in these huge Battle Royale experiences, and people are going to be playing on their little phones, and they're going to be fighting people on PC with mouse and keyboard. Incredible. Uh, I mean, it's... it's uh, it's absolutely a tr it's like a Pokemon Co uh, Pokemon Go sized trend. This battle royale type of uh, gameplay. I know we're going to see a million battle royale uh, derivatives at, at uh, probably at GDC and at E3, um, and who knows how long this is going to last. But uh, I think Fortnite has got the edge, man. I feel like there's a lot more uh, sort of complexity. There's a lot more ways in to enjoy Fortnite, and that that sort of cutesy look that the game has. I think is going to appeal to a lot more players, you know. So it, this is this is really, it's really interesting, kind of watching all of this stuff go. And we talked yesterday about the idea of all these celebrities playing Fortnite at E3. It's going to be nuts. 
And Western gamers finally know when they'll be able to play uh, the latest Valkyria Chronicles game with Valkyria Chronicles 4 about to hit Japan next week. Can't wait for this. Sega has announced that the game will make its Western debut this fall. It will be available simultaneously on the PS4, Xbox One, and Blake, also on the Nintendo Switch. Got a big thumbs up from Blake. Uh, which makes this the first game in the series on the new Nintendo platform. Valkyria Chronicles 4 returns the franchise to, ta to its tactical RPG roots and tells a new story that takes place at the same time as the very first game, but focusing on a new group of characters. Uh, Valkyria Chronicles is a very cool game. I mean, it's uh, definitely borrowing from things like... Uh, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, and uh, you know, with with its RPG, its JRPG storytelling, and its characters and stuff. But it also gave you uh, uh, control of the characters, so you could move around and kind of position your people and uh, in sort of an overhead 3D perspective or behind the character kind of 3D perspective. So it was a little bit more uh, twitchy, a little bit more sort of tactile and fun that way. So a lot of diversity in the the game style and. Uh, a uh, maturity to the storytelling that kind of allied the the sort of you know anime animation kind of look to the experience but it was beautiful and it had you know stories to tell about the disruption of uh, people's lives and the devastation of war and you know the efforts to try to regain peacetime it was it had some powerful messaging in it and it became a cult hit so it's cool that it's coming back and like I just experienced with Yakuza 6 I love Sega's quirky slant on how they make these games, you know, and I love that they, they continue to support titles like Valkyria Chronicles, like Yakuza, uh, hell, even the stuff that uh, that Relic is working on, like, the, and uh, uh, the guys working on the war, on the Total War franchise and stuff like that, they, they, they're just an interesting company, you know, they really, they don't knock it out of the park with everything that they do, but I, I appreciate the the at-bats that Sega takes, you know? Very cool. Looking forward to Valkyria Chronicles 4. We have got an amazing show for you guys today. First off, we're not gonna start with our regular This Day and Everything Cool, because we've got two reviews for you. First up is our Film Fury review of the Tomb Raider film. I'm Johnny Millennium, this is Victor Lucas, and this is Film Fury. Yep. Lara Croft. You shouldn't have come here. I'm glad that you did. Tomb Raider is based on the uh, recent uh, Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix reboots of the Tomb Raider game franchise. It stars Alicia Vikander as Lara Croft. <clears throat> and uh, what did you think, my friend? I didn't like this movie. No. And I saw on Twitter today, you said that we were old enough to see, you know, the launch of the Tomb Raider games on the PlayStation 1. Yep. Then we went into the uh, the movies with Angelina Jolie, yep. which I liked on a very superficial, silly level. Okay. Okay. And well, I did. I thought they were no, stupid and I thought they were fun. They were pretty fun at the time, but they are such a product of the time. That's exactly, and I think that's yes. why I like them. Yeah. And then we saw them go into the incredible, mature, brand new Tomb Raider game yes. that I absolutely love. But I don't know, this is such a mediocre film. I think they're aspiring to go to this level, and I don't think they quite hit that. The same level as the video games. I, I think they were kind of hampered a little bit by that exact <laughs> thing that you're talking about here. There's two things. The games are very mature. Very mature, and Lara Croft is in mortal danger, and you feel every bullet hit, and you, yes. and you feel every fall that she takes. This is not an R-rated movie. This is a movie not. to pack in, you know, and get as much of the, the, you know, the roll into summer crowd as they possibly can. They want younger people to come and see this thing. So they're sort of hemmed in by the fact that we know the storyline from the games. We know what it kind of feels like to be Lara Croft and be Lara Croft for like 20 hours. So the story is a little bit kind of taken out of, uh, you know, if you know the games, you, you, the wind of the, out of the sails a little bit uh, yeah. in this movie, and also mm. it doesn't get as mature in this movie. All that being said, I really think they did a great job at yes. sort of getting the look and feel of Lara Croft, and Alicia Vikander is an excellent Lara Croft. I did not, th I was not sucked in by her performance, I was not charmed by her character, I did not laugh, I did not feel excited, I didn't feel deflated, she, she's I didn't cool. feel anything, she, she, she's fine, she's, like she's a, average. She's not a, she's not a, uh, you know, she doesn't have the charm of uh, Nathan Drake or Indiana Jones, she is more, she's just really, really competent, she's really skilled. She's okay. 
at what she can do. And that's what Alicia Vikander brought to the table. She brought a young person that was, you know, training and, and uh, physically putting herself out there. And, and they set it up with some pretty nice sequences in the beginning where she, uh, Alicia Vikander's in a boxing ring or kickboxing ring and she's fighting, she's getting her ass yeah. kicked. And then she's uh, also in this uh, uh, sort of bike race through the streets of London, which I think was pretty elegantly uh, captured and conveyed. And it, sh it showed the risk-taking prowess her that this person has. Her physicality is not the issue. She yeah. can fight. She can do that, all of I the mean, work that's, and then some. That's most of what this movie is about. L it, let's it, be honest. It really it, is. Yes. It's, it's really about her being poor to start with. Yeah. And then, you know, her saying, no, I don't want my family fortune. Wouldn't want that, you know, at all. Then she kind of finally accepts that. And then she goes on to this adventure yeah. to find this ancient mummy, yeah. we'll say. And uh, it becomes very stereotypical. We've seen this stuff so many times before. Yeah. It doesn't do enough new stuff well, for me. But it's it, not that I have a problem with you, her you know what it is? physicality it doesn't, or that. It doesn't do an, a, enough new things that we yes, haven't that's seen. that's my problem. But it does not does it well. It does does it pretty elegantly. It's wow, it, wow. it's kind of reserved in the way that it puts this 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 picture together. So it's a lot more believable. You actually can see that some of these things can come together. And I think that was the right tactic. That was the right tactic for Crystal Dynamics, and that was the right tactic for the filmmakers here. I will say that all of that is undermined by a really terrible ending sequence, and then there's oh, yeah. an after credit sequence, which is just ridiculous. Uh, but I I enjoyed myself through this movie. I I, did I, not. I had lots of flashbacks to playing the game. Uh, I think the game elevated, and really, when Crystal Dynamics took the, the reins on that series, they put it right up there beside Uncharted, which was not easy to do. And frankly, because the games are so strong, they kind of overshadow this movie. But the movie does pay pretty decent homage to I, the game. I, I thought this movie was cheesy. It was stupid. Wow. It was It was so on the level of mediocre to absolutely dumb. Things we've seen so many times in the 90s again. You didn't, it, you didn't like Walton Goggins as the bad guy? You didn't like oh, that, God, that no, he was no. going kind of crazy? Didn't even care. Not yeah, at I thought all. it was really good. I thought he was solid. Not one character in this movie made me give one flying crap. Not except the... for Nick Frost was in it, and that's yeah. the only guy yeah. that I thought I laughed and smiled when he was on the screen. What about the captain of the boat that no, bring... you didn't care about didn't him? Feel nothing. Okay, all they right. didn't do a very good job of making these people. I, 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 Believably fun and and like I didn't laugh I didn't feel any emotion it's, yeah, watching it's this. It's not a it's not a lighthearted thing and neither were the and Tomb Raider games. And, and you're right. Yeah. With the Tomb Raider games I play those games and I love them as you know yeah. those kinds of experiences. But as a movie going experience it is so average and I'm sitting there I'm like we're going from one action sequence to the next to the next I'm like but it's this stuff we've seen so many times before. I, I, I think I you know I I think that this is going to be a real problem for this movie because we know what the outcome is going to be. You know, that, that sense well, of, of mortal danger is is kind of like the carpet gets pulled out. For everybody that's watching Film Fury and watches my stuff on EPN and, and Johnny's yeah. stuff on Happy Console Gamer, we're all gamers. So yeah. all of us are going to go in and go, well, we know all these beats. And that's going to be a real issue for the thing. All that said, I think they did a really solid oh job God. at building that world on film and that's not easy to do as evidenced by the Should've cheese gone. ball Angelina oh. Jolie movies. Th those are fun when she punched the shark <laughs> underwater. No. That one I, sequence is more fun and had me talking for years listen, this entire movie. I had I, I I have to admit I had fun when I saw those movies. They're un there you go. They're unbearable to watch They're now. unbearable but they're yeah. fun. They're, they're a guilty but, pleasure. But this movie, I think, is actually a pretty solid entry. It's I a think solid they, they beginning. I think they to really capture that video game feeling, and I think they did some interesting action sequence, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't enjoy the... I was just like, yeah, she's going to fall. Yeah, oh, she cut herself. Oh, she's going to, you know, get through here. Oh, she's, like, grappling this guy. Yeah, yeah. she beats him. Yeah. And, and then we go into the ending, and oh, my God, the stereotypical no, I, things that happen I in the story. You. Oh, my God, when she gets to the island. I'm, I won't spoil a thing, but <laughs> it's just like, of course. You won't spoil the thing, but if you played the game, you know what happened. Yeah, well, it's just, it's just, it's just I dumb. think this is going to be the argument for everybody that goes to see a movie with somebody that's played the, the games yeah. before. They're going to have the same discussion. If you really like the game, you're going to get something out of it and at that, some level. And that's that's. But me. I didn't. And I play the game. I'm saying for me personally, I yeah. didn't. Yeah. This should have gone directly to Netflix. I'm sorry. I'm just not that kind of croft. Like, honestly, just straight hey, to Netflix. Hey, careful what you wish for, man. All I know we're like all it. going that direction and all that. So, Vic, I'm gonna we're, we got to do it. Yeah. What are you going to give this movie? I think it's pretty solid. It gets a 7 out of 10 for me. How about you? Wow. I'll, I'll be a bit nice. I'll give it a 6 just because it aspires to be like the game. Okay.
Love working with Johnny, but right now we are joined by a good friend of mine. His name is Rob Keys, and we are going to talk about other big movies. He works for ScreenRant.com and CBR.com. He's the editorial director there, uh, covering movies and TV and everything cool in pop culture, which is our beat as well, and I run into Rob at all kinds of cool places. Thank you so much for joining us, Rob. It's great to see you, buddy. Uh, you too. Thank you for having me on. I've been a big fan of EP since I was a little toddler. Oh, that's awesome, dude. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we ran into each other last year at uh, Star Wars Celebration. Um, That's right. When a lot of stuff was uh, still undetermined about what, what was going to happen with Last Jedi and the announcement of the end of uh, Star Wars Rebels was there. And yeah. uh, uh, and st was there anything around Solo? There wasn't anything about around Solo. No, they kept that back. And, and I think we may have learned after the fact why that might have been the case. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Well, we. we and, and no celebration this year, which is sad. Yeah, I, which is weird as well. Um, yeah. Maybe not a bad move because there has been so much hostility, I think, thrown in the Star Wars direction. How do, how do you feel about that? all of that stuff? Uh, yeah, I think you're actually – I think – I mean I, it's not franchise fatigue. A lot of people like to throw that term around. I think what it is is I think people simmer down – after The Last Jedi, I think there's a, a, a big gap between the initial critics' reactions to that film and the rest of reality. Yeah. And merchandise sales dropped. You, I know you were talking about Battlefront 2 in the previous segment, and that did not hit well at all. Yeah. At the same time, EA canceled another big Star Wars game. So it's like Star Wars is not uh, in, a, in a prime spot like Marvel is right now, for example. Yeah. So. Yeah. And do, do you think it's warranted? I mean, how did you personally feel about The Last Jedi? Uh, you know, it, it's a movie that plays so well on the big screen because it has some of the greatest visuals and sound and, and just moments that are so cool, but yeah. how they connect those moments and the narrative thread and how they handle the characters, especially some of the legacy characters from the original trilogy. I think if you sit down and think about that after the fact, it, it, it doesn't quite fit or work for me. And yeah. I'm, I'm certain JJ Abrams, when he takes on episode nine, will address some of that more. But at the time it's like, it went from being, Oh my God, this is awesome. What's next to be like, Oh man, why are they doing that? And yeah, I can wait for the next one. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of people love the Last Jedi, and I was just talking with Sam Witwer about the same thing. But uh, you can certainly understand why a lot of people were pissed off, right? Like it's yeah. it's easy to kind of wrap your head around that, isn't it? Exactly, and I think uh, on the filmmaker side, they will say they're trying to subvert your expectations, and I'm like, that's good if you're doing something awesome. But things like who Snoke is and why is he the biggest, baddest villain we've ever seen in the Star Wars universe. Yeah. I kind of want to know more about a character like that, you know? Yeah. And they just threw it away like it was nothing. And I think that, that doesn't work. So so let's talk about Solo then. Uh, you know, yeah. I know that you work with Disney all the time and you're you're visiting sets and uh, talking to different people. Maybe not so much. Do you get to the Star Wars sets or are they more? No. Yeah. I they are. Star Wars is a unique beast. And when it comes to the junkets, this is the only film franchise I've heard of in the history of Hollywood yeah. where they don't even let you see the movie before you do the interviews. <laughs> that's how – that's a little they care because Star Wars is so big it sells itself. Yeah. However, with Rogue One, the first sort of risk anthology film, they did show us 30 minutes of footage. And with the, what's going on behind the scenes of Han Solo and the downtrending of the franchise, I wouldn't be surprised if they showed more of that or the whole movie this time around. Yeah, I think they have to kind of win back a little bit, right? How 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 – much of a risk or a, a potential problem is solo do you think if it's not a good movie uh that's a good question it's the whole franchise is sort of at a turning point because you just mentioned rebels is coming to an end but at the same time they're prepping to launch two to three shows both animation and live action and we're bringing back abrams who sort of hit a home run with the force awakens even though you know that there's an argument to be made about that film having its own problems yeah but with the last jedi kind of turning the thing and all the behind the scenes issues with directors like half the creatives have been pushed out halfway through filming a movie that's not a good sign but if you've been following it they've been making all sorts of announcements right like uh benioff and weiss from game of thrones is doing a series uh ryan's coming back to do an all original for the first time ever original star wars trilogy and now we got john forever doing a live action tv show so i think even if han solo stutters a little bit i don't think it will with ron howard and Donald Glover involved, but yeah. if it does, I think they're okay because three years from now, they'll be pumping out two movies and two or three TV shows a year, and if all that stuff is good, no one will care. Yeah, right? it'll be a new, so. a whole new universe, a whole new exactly. bunch of characters and stuff. What, what have you been hearing about Solo? Because I know you know everybody. You got your ear to the it, ground. It, it's it's a mix. I mean, when they brought in Ron Howard to kind of uh, become the fixer, mm -hmm. it was a weird, unique problem because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Miller and, and Lord like, had done 90% of the film. 
yeah. they had to fire them at that point because if they did 91%, all of a sudden they, according to the DGA rules, would have a final say on the theatrical cut, right? Which Disney and Kathleen Kennedy could not let happen. So they went from bringing in Howard to f finish the movie and fix a couple of the scenes to what I hear is reshooting a lot of the film. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's a company man. He gets it. I think they have a very clear plan. I think Disney's strong enough to where like every time they take over a film and try to fix it halfway through, at the very worst, you're going to get something that's competent. Um, and again, the Donald Glover factor, everything that guy touches is awesome. So <laughs> I, I still think it's going to be good. He is amazing. I love Donald Glover. I, you know, I'm getting more and more psyched for Star Wars. I'm not crazy, or for Solo. I'm not crazy about Alden yeah. Ehrenreich, what I've seen so far. Sure. Uh, but hopefully he wins me over. Um, but let, let's talk about... Um, What's interesting is Ready Player One, we just learned mm -hmm. that Spielberg couldn't get the rights to Star Wars, even though Kathleen Kennedy was probably given one of her first big breaks working with Spielberg, right? <laughs> it's actually, there's a live update, everybody, live update. Yeah. It turns out he did. That was like a coy. Oh. They just, I think Eric Davis at Movies.com and Fandango just reported that he actually did manage to get the IP for Star Wars. And I think they're trying to keep it a secret. Oh. So. Oh, what a twist! Oh so my maybe, god! Okay. Maybe there is some kind of Star Wars thing in there. It's, it's I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Uh, my guy just did the junket this week in Hollywood, and I know it played at South by Southwest. They're pretty positive reactions. Yep. I'm not sure yet if Star Wars is in it or not, but man, that would be cool if it was. Oh, I wish that guy hadn't broke that, man. Like, yeah. I, you, I mean, you. You're a fan of this stuff. That's why you're doing this. But I think you're probably like me. It's like we love to do it and talk about it and get some inside stuff. But it yeah. also is kind of a pain in the ass to know all it's the a, secrets, right? It's a very tricky balance, especially yeah. when you're when you're you know this from the game side a lot. Like you get privileged information under embargo, and you have to sort of pretend you don't know that when you're doing you know up to date coverage. And on the film side, you take that to an extreme because yeah. you mentioned set visits. If we visit a film a year and a half out. We have to hold on to the information for a year and a half while yeah. everyone else kind of spills it, you know right, what I mean, right. or it comes out officially. And if you, over the years, like you, if you build connections, you learn even more things you probably shouldn't know. Yep. And again, you can't, you can't share it. But like you said, it's cool to have that. I call it a privilege. It just helps uh, form your own narrative and kind of know what's going on behind the scenes. Well, you know, the, the thing that sort of countered that is how um, how explosively the sort of geek production world has grown. Oh, so yeah. we can't, like even if you are, you know, tapped in in a million places and I am tapped in. in a, we can't know everything. It's impossible True. now, you know. It, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you could keep up with a lot more stuff, but now it's out of control, right? Like Netflix yeah. has a new superhero show every week, it feels like. <laughs> it's so true. And, and I'm sure like, yeah, like we grew up with this stuff. Like the comics that we loved are now games and movies and TV shows and stuff. So in a way, we sort of already know that stuff. And we're just like the lucky few who prepped for that our whole lives. So yeah. uh, on the flip side of it, if they're honoring these adaptations, we sort of kind of know little bits of it already. Yeah. But knowing for real that something's happening in a big movie, it's it's – Definitely a tricky thing to handle. Awesome. Well, I know you were in Vancouver. I'm going to save the Avengers chat for last, and it's awesome that okay. you're here because we got the new trailer for Infinity War dropped today. Uh, but Deadpool 2 was filming in Vancouver. I know you came out to meet uh, with Ryan Reynolds and, and visit the set for that one, right? Uh, no, oh. they, they, not, not for this one. I did for the first one, okay. uh, but this one, it, they're kind of, a. you mentioned Star Wars is kind of at an interesting turning point. I think the X-Men franchise is as well yeah. for two reasons. One, of course, there's the imminent Disney Fox takeover deal, which may or may not still happen. And on the other side of it, they're sort of redoing the franchise in a way. Deadpool changed everything, everything, yeah. right? Rated our movie, uh, no 3d made a ton of money, uh, proved that can work. So now they're building towards that. And the old Brian Singer uh, era of X-Men films is over and Simon Kinberg is stepping in front of the cameras, uh, behind the camera, I should say, for X-Men Dark Phoenix, which is a very weird film. It's his first time directing and it's a film that they're keeping like super under wraps. So mm -hmm. They didn't want any media on set. Same with Deadpool 2. And I know when Simon Kinberg first joined Fox, he did so with a multi-picture contract with the idea of setting up a huge storyline that we haven't seen unfold yet. So I think the reason... Uh, Deadpool 2 and Dark Phoenix are super secretive. It's because we're going to see some time travel stuff, some other crazy stuff, and it's going to change the franchise, potentially, eventually, leading to that crossover we all want to see with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen for sure. Do you, do you yeah. think, uh, well, unless Comcast comes in and, and changes everything, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, and they have the Hulk rights too, right? Which is a whole different can of worms. Yeah, yeah. the, the Comcast. It's it's very yeah. It's, so is Comcast connected to Universal? Is that yes. the whole thing? Yeah, they own NBC okay. Universal. Yeah, right. So they have the distribution rights for Hulk, which is why Marvel can't really make their own solo Hulk movie. They don't want to, anyways. But if they did, they can't unless they had a, a deal with Universal, the same way Sony and Marvel are working together on Spider Man. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that would be 
extremely interesting if Comcast was able to pull that off. I don't know. I mean, giant corporate <laughs> mergers are a thing to be feared in general, maybe. <laughs> but for fans, I don't know what's better. I, I think ultimately, as a Marvel fan, seeing um, the Fantastic Four and X-Men come home is what we want to see in the end, it, right? It is amazing that we put so much faith in these huge for-profit public companies to have our <laughs> yeah. best interests to entertain us. <laughs> yes. But they do for some freaking reason. Somehow they get the right mix of artists and actors and, and uh, writers. Like like I, I did this thing on, on the Marvel MCU movies. I talked for 30 minutes about my 18 favorite you know, flicks and it was easy to do, <laughs> but 18 movies in 10 years, man, it's incredible. What have you heard yes. about Deadpool 2? Do you think it's going to, is it going to be the last Jedi to Force Awakens or is oh, it, is it going to be a bigger movie than uh, Deadpool? It's a good question. There's mixed reports on these, what they call test screenings of whether that was well received. And people I know with inside information said like it was actually very, very well received what they've seen. Cool. I think it'll be cool because it's going to be different. Uh, also, because David Leach is directing this one. And if you haven't seen John Wick, yeah. wow, yeah. you're in for something special. I had the good fortune of meeting him on the set of The Wolverine where he directed second unit. So all the awesome, the best Wolverine action you've seen came from David he gets it. If you've seen John Wick, you should not question the action we're going to see in Deadpool 2. And of course, you're bringing in Cable and a bunch of other mutant characters who are going to form X-Force. So I think it's different enough with enough new characters that it, it, it chill. I think it's going to be good for old fans and people who are sort of uncertain about it. I think it might be good. You brought up Wolverine, man. And I know that you know people and you've talked with Jackman a bunch of times over his career. Is he done? <sighs> yeah, he it swears he's done. But, you know, when I talk to executives at Fox, they're like, you know... Maybe he'll do a cameo, but I think I really do think his time is up. As much as I personally want to see him come back yeah. for like X Force, it's it's currently not in the cards. He could totally just keep playing old man Logan. Like he could yeah. just grow up into, uh, and he is such a good performer. He would totally pull it off. It'd be amazing. Oh man! And the next layer of that, could you imagine him opposite Robert Downey Jr. Yes. as Iron Man? Oh man, yeah. that's a fan dream, right? Yeah. But yeah. So yeah, I think there, there's I, you you're holding out hope. I'm holding out hope. Yes, we are holding it right. <laughs> okay, uh, Jurassic World Two is a, is the uh, you know big sequel. I kind of poo poo this movie, but yeah. the, because I didn't like the first movie that much, but it made so much money and it made so many people happy. So maybe this will be good. Or do you, do you think this will be good? I don't. I, yeah. I I did not like Jurassic World. I did not understand the fascination with it, other than the fact that we hadn't had a big budget dinosaur movie in like 10, 20 years. Yeah. But I don't get it. I thought it was just dumb yeah. uh, it was really really dumb and you know way too much of a rehash of the first one and uh, you know from the trailers i've seen of the second one it's just cgi nothingness with characters i don't care about it's hard to yeah. it's not working for me but like you said the first one beat the avengers at the box office so i don't get it i just don't get it with this one it is weird right i mean we love our dinosaurs um <laughs> yeah. i i yeah i'm sort of with you like i just don't know it's colin trevorrow back right at the helm of this one uh, he's producing and helping write it. It's uh, I think it's J. A. Bayona okay. directing this one actually. Oh, he yeah. Did, he but, did, but, what did he do last? He's 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 got uh, some good stuff, right? He has very good stuff. What, it's sort of like Trevor. It? it came from a monster calls. Yeah, God, that's right. Which yes. is a good movie. So that was cool. So maybe there'll but, be a little more character work, a little bit more. I mean, he's got good performers. I think so. You know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, people had a lot of issues with the characters in the first one, so I imagine on the script for the second one, that was the focus. Yeah. But against the backdrop of like unlimited CGI dinosaurs falling off mountains, I don't know how much <laughs> I really care. I know, right? So <laughs> I know, I know. All right, uh, one that I know you're excited for. I am. I can't freaking wait for this. I don't know if you, you, you got access to Pixar. They're very secretive too, but uh, Incredibles 2 is coming. What's the word? Yeah. What's the buzz? So I will know more very soon. In about two weeks, we're going to visit Pixar and kind of find out what's going on. But I mean, Brad Bird is back. He's been talking about making this movie for 15, I guess, when the first one came out, 2004. So like yeah. 14 years. It's a crime this hasn't that's taken so long. Yes. But hey, look, they're the only ones to get the Fantastic Four sort of formula to work <laughs> on screen. Uh, and they're bringing back everybody. I'm sure it's going to be charming. I mean, if you look at the, just like the Oscars record of Disney Animation and Pixar, like they don't really miss. Yeah. Uh, and Incredibles is a very special brand. Everyone's back. I, I think just for the limited of, a bit of what I know, I would expect very good things from that film. Yeah, I'm, I'm super psyched. Do you, do you feel like uh, like Brad Bird tried his hand with some live action stuff and it didn't really take off for him? Do you, do you feel like uh, he's going back and he's like, he's going back to what's familiar and what's sort of more of his comfort zone? Or is, is he just question. meant to be an animation director? I don't know. I, I think it's a, a, it's hard to base any, any, 
analysis on, on just this movie alone because the Incredibles is very near and dear to him yeah. and fans. So yeah. I think he's maybe always wanted to do this and now there's finally an opportunity to do so. But to what you're saying, like after this, I wouldn't be surprised if he did, I don't know, like another Mission Impossible well, movie or something like that. He's the perfect so. candidate to revitalize Fantastic Four, you know? Wow. Like this guy Dude. totally understands a super family. Why not make the live action, <laughs> right? Yo, Kevin Feige, call up Vic. He's got an idea. Like, you're right, 100%. He could totally do that under like the Marvel Studios umbrella. I yeah, could see that. That would be amazing. And what's weird now is that we have Big Hero 6, The Incredibles, all of the MCU. It's all <laughs> this in the, under the, and Star Wars. It's all under one umbrella, which is insane. Yeah, yeah yes. it definitely is. Yeah. It's all, all at those theme parks and on the toy shelves. They, they know what they're doing when it comes to superheroes. D- for sure. Disney could just make their own Ready Player One. They don't even... <laughs> They don't even need to do yes. it. <laughs> Although they sort of tried, though, on the video game front. Yes, right? that's right. The Infinity and that. You saw what IP lawyers could do with a franchise yeah, like that. That's true. Uh, that's true. It's too bad, but I would love to see that. And have, did they give you access to the, the set of Ant-Man and the Wasp? Uh, it's possible they did. We can talk about that. Oh, <laughs> very nice. Side. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that movie looks cool for sure. <laughs> um, okay. Um, why does it look cool? Uh, well, look, the first one had a bit of an issue with Marvel. And you look, go back to phase one, phase two era of Marvel Studios, and there was an, a very widely publicized issue between creative control, right? Yeah. They, like all the directors of the phase one movies got pushed out. We didn't have a bad time at Age of Ultron. Alan Taylor had the worst time of his life on Thor, the sequel, not even knowing what he's shooting each day. Yeah. Uh, so they've been all pushed out. And, and Edgar Wright, who was like sort of the first director attached to Marvel Studios to do Ant-Man going back to like – 2006 or something like he had a decade he was trying to make this happen and they finally got the chance to in two weeks before filming creative control and they out he goes they brought in peyton reed who almost made like a 60 set fantastic four movie we we're talking about that earlier yeah with kevin feige years earlier for fox he did a tremendous job he, him and paul Rudd of all people helped rewrite the script and they did it last minute and it came together as like a solid action movie i really but love this that time, movie yeah it's, it's very good, and it's one of the few movies that touches on the idea and the theme of family, yeah. which is you don't see very much in these in these yeah. movies, and you're going to see more of this year. Um, yeah, but this time Peyton Reed gets to start from, from scratch, and he gets to do it with uh, some of the guys behind Community and some of the guys who wrote uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. So I think they get it. They're very motivated, and we get to see Wasp finally debut on screen. I think it's going to be very cool. And uh, for you Marvel Cinematic Universe fans, this one, more than any other movie, has the most direct ties to what's happening in Avengers Infinity War and the untitled Avengers 4. So there's, there's a lot going on. That's awesome. Have you um, seen more than we have maybe of uh, Evangeline Lilly in action as a superhero? Uh, no, I, th- I think most of what we would see in terms of concept art and photos and some behind the scenes stuff has been publicized. Uh, I think as soon as Age of, uh, sorry, as soon as Infinity War hits theaters, you're going to see a very harsh rollout of that type of content that you're looking for. So there's a lot coming very soon. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the Marvel folks must just be on cloud nine right now with the success of Black Panther. It's like they can't miss, wow. right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's it's about t- on one end, on one hand it's like it's about damn time they did Black Panther. On the other hand, wow, they chose the best time ever to make that movie Absolutely, in the history yeah. of the world, right? Yeah. So yes, it's so good because we're not only going to get these guaranteed Black Panther sequels, which they knew were going to happen before they even shot that one, but you're going to see a lot of those fan favorite characters show up in other Marvel projects in the future, and that's perhaps even more exciting. So Wakanda is like an anchor point for the whole universe going forward. Yeah. It, it- it seems like a logistical and financial nightmare to think about how all of these characters are going to cross thread and, and be everywhere. But I think mm-hmm. ultimately what it really does, it gives Marvel and Disney a whole bunch of different casting choices at any given moment, right? Like they, they don't yeah. need to have, you know, Chadwick Boseman, put, you know, to show up over here. They can have Shuri show up over here, you know? Exactly. They've got a lot of chess pieces and they, they can just move them around. Doesn't have to be yeah. Nick Fury everywhere, you know. And, much, and, much to and, Sam Jackson's uh, dismay. And it's funny because sure, he's like a, a, on paper that's a supporting character, but in reality, it's one of the coolest characters we've ever seen in a superhero movie. Who's yeah. going to show up in ten more movies, and that's awesome. Uh, but at the same time, the branding and the franchise and the world building has been so strong. Not only can they just pick supporting characters and put them anywhere to help bolster a cast, but they can just add new characters like like it's nothing because people would totally pay to see it. Imagine Shuri and. Pick any character from the comics you haven't seen yet, yeah. and like people would line up to see that, and it would make minimum three quarters of a billion dollars. So they're in a very good spot. Uh, in Black Panther, I think it's a game changer yeah. for a lot of reasons. I mean, I sure. could see Shuri in an Iron Man costume. 
That's so it's funny. On set, of, I can say I was on set for that one. Yeah. Uh, the first, when we didn't know anything about the character other than who she was in the comics, you know, like a potential future leader of Wakanda, yeah. potential Black Panther herself. When they introduced her, they said she's like the head of this design group. Even though she's only 16 years old, she's the smartest person in the universe, smarter than Tony Stark, and she makes cool costumes that other heroes wear. So as soon as I saw that, I was like, for sure, if Tony Stark's on his way out, sure he can fight, can build, can lead. She's a natural leader, whether she leads Wakanda or a new team of heroes like the Avengers. Maybe all of those things together. Why not do it all, right? <laughs> I love this. This is this is yeah. total nerd talk, man. I love it. Okay, cool. well, we're going to talk about Avengers in a sec, but I want to talk about 55-year-old juggernaut Tom Cruise cannot be stopped. Mission Impossible <laughs> Fallout. The trailer was cool. I love the last Mission Impossible movie. What? I, I love all of them except the second one. So I'm And the second one, you're one. probably like me. When you first saw it, it's like, this is amazing. And then you watch yeah. it again, it's like, this is so not amazing. Uh, this is I'll so bad. I'll never forget that John Woo <laughs> slow-mo sequence, which is like five frames a second yeah. as they dodge. But I was like, what is happening? No, no more of that. But uh, you know, Abrams came in, Brad Bird came in, McQuarrie came in. These are all like good people to work with Tom Cruise. McQuarrie yeah. and Cruise especially. Yeah. That's like a, an amazing Hollywood power couple. Yes. Uh, the only problem with this film, and I'll bring this up again with Avengers Infinity War, yeah. is there's no Jeremy Renner. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of Renner. He was a <laughs> great character. He was supposed to take this franchise over. And Tom Cruise was like, no, the mummy didn't work. I'm back. We're just going to do keep doing Mission Impossible films. And I'm cool because Tom Cruise is the craziest stunt actor in the history of film. So, have you uh, have you met Tom Cruise? Have you ever been a, been in a junket? Oh, or? man. No. I have not. Only in a group scenario at Comic-Con. I have not did one-on-one. I had a 10-minute interview with him and Doug Lehman for um what's that movie called that airplane movie came out and I, oh, I yeah the, the canceled it last minute oh. because of the London tube bombings that day oh, so the wow. flights got messed up so that was my chance Vic oh man yeah Didn't no I'm happen. a big fan of Cruz like he, he there's a lot of crazy stuff in his personal life and lots sure. of weirdness but yeah his movies are usually pretty damn fun you know and I love the last one well I can't remember what it was called I think Rogue Nation was the Rogue last Nation one. yes I thought that was great Rebecca Ferguson stole the movie amazing. I thought she was incredible and she's back in this one so I'm super psyched Macquarie is amazing a film a yes. great filmmaker uh, I'm with you 100% on Cruise. You know, he sold me at Comic-Con years ago when he was prom uh, promoting All You Need Is Kill, which became Edge of Tomorrow. They keep renaming that film. Yeah. Uh, when he came on stage, he says, look, man, all I want to do is make awesome freaking movies. And I was like, yes, and that's what you're doing. They yeah. did Oblivion, Edge of Tomorrow, yeah. the resurgence of Mission Impossible. Every single one of these movies has been amazing, except for The Mummy. We won't, yeah. we won't talk about that. But everything else is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how he – it would be interesting to get his take on what the hell happened with The Mummy. Because he even in The Mummy, he was still Tom Cruise. It's just yeah. like they had the camera over like a, an inch too far. Like they, they screwed him. <laughs> you know, he brought all the Tom Cruise that you can get it's, into the movie. It's just they, they didn't capture it right. You know, it was I don't, I, it's hard to know. I mean, if you, according to the trades, it was he had sort of final approval on like every aspect of that film. Mm -hmm. So maybe there were some issues. But also it was the first time directorial debut for um, – Wow, well, what's his face? Yeah, that's a Bob Orsi's old writing partner. Yeah, Kurtzman, Alex Kurtzman. Yeah, so maybe that's part of it. And they they tried to do that shared cinematic universe thing. Where they announced five movies before they make one good one, and yeah. it's like, no, you don't, you can't do that in today's you day. Can't and age. You got to earn it. Yes, exactly. You got to earn it. Well, let's talk about a franchise that has earned it, and we can run a little bit of the uh, Avengers: Infinity War uh, footage here. But uh, new trailer dropped. Uh, I think you've been on set and you've uh, talked with everybody. I think you can tell us a little bit about uh, yes, I can. what the camaraderie was. And, you know, we've seen the, uh, if anybody's been sort of paying attention, there was that huge video that went out with all of the cast members getting up on stage and celebrating 10 years of the MCU. What was the mood on set like, man? Uh, I think... It's hard to describe. I, I, it's special. It was very special because, yes, you're bringing together all these people and the most <laughs> – the biggest accomplishment in film scheduling ever. Yeah. Uh, but it was the first time a lot of people met. You know what I mean? Like getting to sit down with uh, – I should say that the, we did visit the set last June. Uh, they were like 60 days into shooting. It was a very weird schedule. Like they'd begin shooting in February – but it was only day 60 of filming because there's so many breaks in between. And like you said, people flying in and now they shot Guardians and Spider-Man stuff and they do the rest of the team, then Iron Man's team. It's just, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Then they had a couple of weeks break. To, then they started Avengers 4. And, um, you know, <laughs> they said if they had to like, do these back to back, they would essentially shut down Hollywood because they had like 150 of the highest profile actors <laughs> all together in, you know, a matter of weeks. So that was pretty cool. And our, our, so our set visit embargo lifted this week. We started with our Chadwick Boseman and, um, 
Mark Ruffalo interview. And it was cool because it was the first time Banner had met the king of Wakanda. And like that interaction, it was cool because the actors were first starting to work together and like just hearing them like compliment each other. And like the idea that a lot of these actors are working with their own heroes in the business too. So that's, that shines through. It's kind of neat seeing like uh, Mark Ruffalo explain like this is royalty on screen. I have to react to that. And then Don Cheadle, it was his first day on set and seeing him walk. He can walk again, by the way, because he's got like an exoskeleton suit. He took a little bit of damage in the last movie. But yeah. uh, seeing those guys interact, it's cool. It's funny. If you love that banter you saw in Civil War, it's like that to the nth degree uh, in this film. So we got to talk to Chris Evans and his team of Ragtag Avengers. Like th- that takes place two thirds – throughout the movie and they go to Wakanda and meet Black Panther and all the heroes you love from this year's Black Panther. By the way, they could not have timed this better. Black Panther is destroying the box office, yes. winning critics and fans. Yeah. And now they're like the center point of the Avengers movie coming out a few months later. Smart. It's very Marvel's smart. And smart. You, you know, they they uh, they plot it and they plan it, but they don't know, right? They send it up and, and people showed up, man. They want this stuff, you know? Exactly. People say they don't take risks, but you got to remember, you go back to the beginning. They were making Avengers before Thor and Captain America even came out, and the same thing's happening now. Yeah. Every year you get at least one new IP, and they're already producing five movies ahead. So like that in and of itself is a risk, especially when each one of these films is trying to explore kind of a different genre or hybrid of genres. Are people in Hollywood walking around following Kevin Feige with uh, cloning machines? Are they they (laughs) trying to like kidnap him (laughs) to try to bring him to other studios or something? The guy is a playmaker. Yeah. You know, he comes from, like us, a comic book growing up, a comic book nerd, and he he put in the work. He was like an assistant to the Donners, which is how he got in the franchise. He was like an assistant on the X-Men films. And by the way, you mentioned Hugh Jackman earlier. Hugh Jackman complimented Kevin Feige. He was the only guy who went out of his way, even as an, a, a lowly assistant, and like made Jackman feel amazing, took him out for dinner. And it's like that thinking pays off, and it's why the actors love working for Feige so much, and it's why – Feige, to talk business for a second, was able to take Marvel Entertainment and take his studio division and pull it out and join Disney and keep it away from the rest of Marvel Publishing. And that's how he's able to keep all these actors coming back. Because Robert Downey Jr. was supposed to leave this franchise like five times already. Yeah. But he keeps coming back because Feige is a, a, a very talent and creative focused guy who gets it. And like I said, he's a playmaker. Like you said, he, he plans ahead in, in so many ways, right? Yeah, so. there is some there is some uh, dirty baggage and and stuff in there with the Marvel publishing side and and lots sure. of uh, hostility and all that. So that that's a story for another day. Yeah, <laughs> Thanos is so important to this movie. There are so many heroes, and only one Thanos. Is mm-hmm. he gonna is he gonna really deliver? Is he gonna create the threat that that sort of makes us you know, not think he's just going to be wiped out by all this ferocious, heroic talent that's out there. That single question is the make or break of the entire film because yeah. Thanos, they've been, they've been teasing him for years. Um, but going back to when I visited the Guardians 2 set, we talked to Feige there and he said, look, straight up, Avengers Infinity War, or at that time it was Infinity War Part 1, uh, was the Thanos movie. Like he gets half the screen time. It really is. The whole film is structured around him assembling the ultimate plot MacGuffins of the franchise, these six Infinity Stones. Uh, so he's going to get a lot of screen time. But what they have to do right off the bat is, is position him in a way that we, the audience, fears him. Because so far, he's been a joke. Like, every time we see him on screen, he fails. Yeah. He gave away a stone to Loki. Loki failed. He let Ronan talk down to him and get the Power Stone in Guardians, the first Guardians movie. And it's like he does nothing. For a guy who's supposed to be one step ahead all the time and the ultimate tactical genius, he hasn't been. He's just a so dude on a chair, pretty much. Just a big purple dude who loves space chairs. Yeah. And I think if I were – Marcus and McFeely, the writers of the next Avengers movies, the first thing you do is you bring him in and kill someone fans love. Yeah. And then you're like, oh no, stakes are for real. And I think you're going to see some serious losses uh, in this movie and Avengers 4. And that will make Thanos a worthy villain. Plus he's got, I don't know if you've, you saw, I'm sure you saw the trailer. Yeah. We get to meet a couple of his other children, the yeah. Black Order. Yeah. He's got four powerful henchmen with him and an army of cgi alien dogs we won't talk about that but he's got he's got some <laughs> friends who are going to help him out so i think i think they're going to do it so that's awesome uh is dc ever going to catch up with marvel <laughs> playing catch up is what they've been what's been killing them they've been trying to copy marvel without building we talked about earning it like universal failed to do with their monster movie universe yeah same thing happened with Warner Brothers, you know, uh, a couple executive decisions, a couple producer decisions, and then trying to rush to get their own Avengers on screen kind of killed them in the end. And they end, found themselves making movies they weren't ready to make. And 
a lot of behind the scenes messiness. And now they're stuck in a position where nobody likes the franchise, but they have a couple of heroes everyone loves, like one woman in Aquaman. So what do you do? You can't reboot it. So they're going to try to take what they love, add a few pieces on the outside, maybe recast Batman, and then we'll go from there. So yeah. uh, do you want them to recast a, Batman? I personally don't because I wanted to see them follow through on the age, the bitter Batman who's reformed. Uh, and I actually – I don't mind. I thought Ben Affleck as Bruce Wayne and all the elements around him, yeah. uh, you know, Jeremy playing Alfred, his Batmobile, his Batcave, the ruined – Bruce, uh, the Wayne Manor like in ruins, all those things were super strong pieces of lore and he was great. They just put him in stories that weren't necessarily as great. Yeah. And I think it's a shame that he is dealing with some personal stuff, which may force him out. And also on the studio side, they may not want him. And also at the same time, Warner Brothers may be building multiple universes. Like there's a new Joker movie, a new Batman movie. We don't even know if it's the same thing. Nobody knows, right? <laughs> it's a total mess. So it's like, it's like shotgunning 100 ideas and like just five or six of these will make money and people will like them yeah. and we'll just go from there. I mean you said Shazam in the pre-show. They're making Shazam movie in Toronto yeah. and they haven't even made a Flash movie. Like what is happening? I, I don't – it's hard to say, man. Yeah, and the Flash movie is Flashpoint, which is going to disrupt all of this stuff. I just and, watched Justice League again. I just reviewed it again. I watched it on Blu-ray and I actually and, loved it. I loved it on the second viewing. I actually was sure. – I caught the comic stuff and – uh, they there was a lot of heart poured into it, even though it was kind of a mess. I really enjoyed the movie, you know. I when I came out of that as well, I thought, hey, look, at the very least, they got the heroes right. It was really fun seeing these six heroes all get their own personalities, all get their time to shine on screen. Um, you can say what you want about the, the villains and the yep. CGI and stuff like that, but they like th what they failed to do all along is develop heroes we care about, and I think they successfully did that. Yep. And coming out of Justice League, I want to see a cyborg movie. Yep. You know, I want to see Flash. Yes. So that in and of itself is a success, even though they had to shoot that film twice and it was a total disaster yeah, yeah. at the box office. But I mean, they tried. So I'm going to end. We could talk all day, and I know everybody yeah. wants us to because we're all <laughs> of the same mind here. But uh, what happens with Marvel if um, if we lose Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Evans, God forbid, in their characters? Uh, I think they've already sort of set up the answer to that. So I I mean, you have Falcon become the next Captain America. You have Captain Marvel become the new leader of the Avengers. And now your side characters are Doctor Strange, the all-new Spider-Man. It's Valkyrie becomes the new Thor. It's like they've got themselves in such a good position where they can take – you saw that 10th anniversary shoot and there was like 80 actors there. And yeah. that's not even half of the actors they have. Yeah. You pick any six of them, throw them in a movie, Marvel Studios branding, boom. You got, a, you got something that plays into a larger story that people will like. I think the, it's very intentional that some of these characters, even some of the ones you mentioned – uh, will die or at least shift out of the main picture. They could become background characters or be stuck in a different time period. So um, that that's okay because they have enough characters in each, each one of those sub-franchises with enough new IP to back it up that they can still have the Avengers. I mean, you read the comics, you know how it is. You read the comics from two years ago, none of these characters we see as the original six from the first Joss Whedon Avengers movie was on that team in the comics. Yeah. But it was still an Avengers comic, and that's kind of the beauty of that rotating roster. Yeah. Fresh blood, new creators, new heroes, and every once in a while, you bring those guys back. So. Yeah, and I guess you know, 20 years from now, they could just start it all over again. And also, <laughs> these movies are very CGI heavy. I, I, I bet you a lot of money Disney and Marvel own the digital rights to some of these characters. So who's to say we can't have hologram Tony Stark for another 50 years, yeah, right? That's, it's happening in the comics. So That's what I'm uh, guessing, actually. That's what I'm guessing. Okay, so yeah. I think we both agree Avengers Infinity War will be the biggest movie of the year. Yes. Uh, it, it should be. Yes, it should be. Should yes. be. Um, have you ever met Joel Edgerton? Uh, yes. You look just like him. Which, has, Thank you. Has anybody I, ever he's, said he's that? A, he's a very handsome, hardworking dude. <laughs> have, <laughs> have you ever stood beside Joel Edgerton? Because it, it no, yeah. but I've had people say that before. Yeah, I'm because uh, I just saw Red Sparrow and I'm looking at you. And I'm like, who the hell does this guy remind me of? And oh, it's Joel Edgerton. <laughs> okay, so Infinity War is going to be number one. What's going to be number two and three? I mean, Black Panther could be one of the top two or three. Right. I mean, people Jesus. say yeah. some people say Black Panther might even beat Avengers, but after today's trailer, I'm like, I don't know about that because yeah. like this is almost Black Panther two plus the biggest Avengers movie you've ever seen. Could you imagine uh, if it's Avengers and it's so big and popular, 
that <laughs> it becomes Avengers, Black Panther, and Ant Man are the one, two, and three of twenty eighteen. Yeah, Incredibles, Han Solo, and Disney just walks <laughs> home with a bunch of gold in their hands. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Oh my God. Uh, I, I don't think Ant Man is the billion type of billion dollar movie, but who knows? It depends. If Avengers: Infinity War does some crazy stuff and sets up Ant Man and the Wasp, then you're like, oh, well, maybe you have to see this movie because it connects to the next one or something. But I feel like that's a movie that won't quite make a billion. Um, but who knows? It's it's a it's it's a fun question to ask. It, it ultimately, if it's really friggin' good, word of mouth will carry that through. Especially if they, if if Avengers: Infinity War is super well received. Uh, the question marks are on Jurassic World. Yeah, like that could get half as much money as the first one if, if it's as bad as I think it looks. Yeah, uh, and as you may think it looks. Yeah. Um, and then Han Solo. I mean, if it makes Rogue One money, that's it's gonna hit a billion. But if it's doesn't pick up some steam, it's not even gonna cross a billion. Yeah, I mean, so Last Jedi was a huge smash too. I mean, it's it wasn't sure. the it wasn't maybe the smash that everybody wanted it to be in all senses of the word, but it still made tons of money. So, yeah, so I wouldn't yeah. count Solo out. Solo might be, uh, I still, I think Avengers will be at the top, but Solo is going to yeah. be up near there too. Hopefully it's great. So Rob, you're fantastic, man. I, I, uh, I hope we can have you back on the show soon. Anytime, man. Anytime. This is awesome. Okay. Well, you rock. Thank you so much. Uh, right now we are going to take a look at this day and everything cool. Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for March 16th. We all go a little crazy sometimes, and on this day in 1960, audiences were crazy for Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. We all go a little mad sometimes. The film premiered in Hollywood, although it wouldn't go into wide release across the U.S. and the rest of the world until later that same year. Based on the novel of the same name, Psycho tells the chilling tale of the isolated Bates Motel and its unusual manager, Norman, and revolves around a string of murders apparently committed by his mother, Norma. A boy's best friend is his mother. Psycho saw the already accomplished Hitchcock perfect the use of camera tricks, editing, and music cues to put the audience on edge. It was also arguably the first slasher movie and established other horror movie tropes that we won't spoil. The film has served as the basis for several sequels, remakes, rip-offs, and even a recent A&E television series. On March 16th, 2016, one of the world's oldest game makers embraced a whole new kind of gaming. Nintendo launched their very first mobile app, Miitomo, on iOS devices in Japan. It wasn't a mobile game, but instead a social app where users created little avatars and then interacted with each other. It was a hit at first, with many users curious about what Nintendo had to offer in the mobile space, but its popularity soon dwindled, and Nintendo announced plans to shut down the servers in early 2018. Luckily, they didn't stop at Mitomo. Nintendo has since released actual games for mobile devices, which have proven to be a lot more successful. March 16, 1999 was a big day in gaming over on the PC. Sony Online Entertainment released the original EverQuest, thrusting players into a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, a genre that eventually became known as MMORPG. EverQuest was one of the first MMORPGs to strike at big, becoming a hit with mainstream players and not just die-hard fantasy fans. It's estimated to have had at least 200,000 subscribers in the first year, unprecedented at the time, with almost half a million by 2003. Sony Online Entertainment followed it up with successful sequels throughout the early 2000s, although the most recent entry, EverQuest Next, was cancelled in 2016. Sony Online Entertainment has since become independent from Sony and renamed themselves Daybreak Game Company. They've retained ownership of the EverQuest franchise, though, so there's always a chance they can revisit it down the road. Man, we have had a lot of movie talk on our episode of EP Live today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I see JBJ Blaze out there and Timberwolf and Paul Adamson and uh, uh, who else is in here? We we have uh, Donnie S. Swangor, Julian Collins. Up. Uh, it's great to see everybody. DM's asking, where is Tommy T? Tommy T is probably on a stage uh, rehearsing for Video Games Live tonight somewhere out there. Adrian Leon, thank you so much for being here. Kerry, Dustin, you guys are all rocking to uh, celebrate Friday with me today. And it's been fun talking about movies, but how about we talk about a video game? Uh, here is my review of Burnout uh, Paradise Remastered. It's not in 4K. We shot this in 4K. Later on today, it will be posted as a 4K thing. But uh, let's take a look at the video. 
Electronic Arts has had the good sense to bring out a remastered version of Burnout Paradise. This is uh, the classic Criterion game that came out for the PS3 and Xbox 360 and the PC, which you can actually play in 4K if you've got the machine to handle it. Uh, but this is a 4K-friendly version of Burnout Paradise. Of course, it will play on the Xbox One, the regular one, and the regular PlayStation 4. But if you want to see this thing in all of its 4K and 60 frames per second glory, you need to check this thing out on the Xbox One X and the PlayStation 4 Pro. There's a lot of names to remember now with all these machines. And I can tell you, I now possess Burnout Paradise uh, at least five times. And it's sort of in contention with Super Metroid and Earthbound for how many versions of a game I can have. Uh, I got the PlayStation 4 Pro code or the PS4 code from uh, EA and I loaded that up instantly. I played it on EP Live a few days ago. Uh, had a lot of fun jumping right back in. But in my mind's eye, it didn't look... You know, I played it on a regular PlayStation 4, and when I saw it, I was like, well, this kind of looks like I remember Burnout Paradise looking. Um, and uh, when I played it on the PS4 Pro, I was like, wow, this does look really, really nice. But the cool thing is, is that Xbox had a, a Games with Gold thing going on with uh, the original Burnout Paradise for 360. You could just download that for free, and so I didn't have to go and find the disc. I just downloaded it, and I, I got a chance to do a little head-to-head -head comparison between the 360 version of Paradise, which still looks pretty good, against the PS4 Pro, which looks way better. It kicked its total ass. But then I did one other thing. I checked out the Digital Foundry uh, deep dive into the 4K remastering of Burnout Paradise. And man, those people do uh, God's work. I feel so dumb when I watch their, the videos from Digital Foundry. <laughs> they just went into all the filtering and all the you know anti-aliasing technologies and the texture details and the, the blurring effects. It's it's incre it's all it's too much for my little pea brain to handle, but it was um, you know it was very cool. But what they focused on was the uh, EA Access release of Burnout Paradise remastered because it came out a little earlier, and they hadn't played the PS4 Pro one. And I was like, God, I I need to see what this looks like on the X. So I downloaded the X version, and I did a, a straight head to head, and the X takes it by a country mile. It's not that the PS4 Pro version looks bad. I had to kind of adjust the brightness and the contrast to make it look a little sweeter. It was a little too dark and weirdly saturated. So I adjusted that, played this all on an OLED screen, uh, and it looked great, but I really wanted to see how the 4K uh, 60 frames per second handled on the Xbox One X and holy crap is it sweet. Everything is beautiful and rock solid. You can read all the signs super clearly from a mile away. Uh, the, the speed, the sensation of crashing, all of that stuff. It's fully realized in both the PS4 Pro and Xbox One X. Don't mistake this for me saying the, the PS4 Pro version of Burnout Paradise Remastered is a dog because it's not. It's amazing. And I actually got a little more accustomed to playing it on the DualShock 4 controller, so it felt weird to jump over to the Xbox One and have that same... It just, you know, when you're jumping between consoles, sometimes you just get accustomed to one thing. And I'd already plowed through a hundred of those yellow signs and found shortcuts and stuff on the PS4 Pro version. Is that how you play Burnout Paradise? Every billboard and every yellow sign is what I go and hunt for first. Before I activate the, uh, the break in the gas, and jump into the burning roots and the races and the takedowns and holy crap is this game fun if you've never played burnout paradise i have so much envy for you because you're about to play something that is out of this world addictive and fun and uh, engaging it was great to hear dj atomica's voice it was great to hear the old cool music you know blasting through because it has the soundtrack from the original game uh and i just was instantly hooked and transported back to that, that sort of moment of elation. And the thought occurred to me is that EA uh, brought this game out uh, it, kind of for us. You know what I'm saying? Like the people that have been lifers, that have been playing games for a long time, that are a little bit sort of worried about what the, the state of the business is. Is everything never going to have an ending? Is everything going to be kind of microtransaction to death? Are we just playing games as service forever now? Uh, and then this comes out, and it's a total shock, and, you know, EA execs have gone on record before. Peter Moore, I'm talking to you, buddy. Miss you, pal. Uh, saying that, uh, you know, we don't do remasters, we're moving forward and all that stuff. But, God, there are so many games. You guys see me talking about great EA games from the, the back catalog. So many games that EA has that should absolutely 
get this kind of level of attention and detail. I would say let's kick it up a notch, you know, even better because the Blue Point remaster of uh, Shadow of the Colossus, that sort of set the bar. You gotta, I mean, and that was a big deal. That was almost like going in and redoing so much of the game and they didn't quite do that with this remaster, uh, although the textures are there, the the uh, the unbelievable sort of anti-aliasing and fidelity in there, it's just gorgeous. Um, and they added like, uh, kick you in the ass bass effects every time you press the boost button. The, one, the other, one other weird thing about this is that there's so much of the DLC, I think almost all of the DLC is unlocked, if not all of the DLC. So you get all the awesome cars. So right away, uh, I went for the DeLorean-ish. Uh, and so I'm hovering and flying, and I just felt so fast and kind of invincible. I was knocking down the gates and knocking down the challenges pretty quickly. I loved what Criterion did, though, with the um, uh, taking your picture with the camera and sticking it on your license and stuff. There's so many great, clever hooks in here. I'm going to be playing Bird Out Paradise probably for the rest of my life, like you guys. It's so addictive. I'll buy it on the PS5. I'll buy it on the Xbox One, Two, or whatever they're gonna call it. I said on EP Live that I don't know if it's really worth it if you already own it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Not only is it way better looking and just it feels incredible and all the, the online stuff is all updated and all that, but it's also a great show of support for uh, you know, quality games being brought back in an excellent way like this. And if you have the Xbox One X or the PlayStation 4 Pro, this has got must-buy written all over for it. If you have both, get the X version. I love this game. It's amazing to go back to it. Would love 3 and 4 remastered if uh, you're listening EA and Criterion. I'm going to give Burnout Paradise remastered a 9 out of 10. We are back after a little Burnout Paradise remastered. Uh, the game is incredible. Very hard to put the controller down, if you know what I'm saying. And I just go right for the, all of those yellow fences. Uh, love that game. And I'm also a big fan of Hugh Jackman. We talked about him earlier. Uh, he was in a, a bunch of not very good Wolverine movies, but he was in a very, very cool Wolverine game. Let's take a look. Today's Buried Treasure is dedicated to our fiercest Canadian superhero. Of course, I'm talking about Wolverine. There have been many Wolverine games over the years, but the best one was developed by Raven. It's called X-Men Origins Wolverine. X-Men Origins Wolverine was a disappointing movie, but this game was hack and slash and gore and blood everywhere. It's an M-rated game. It came out on the 360 and the PlayStation 3. Got a little repetitive. It wasn't the best design we've ever seen before, but in the era of The Devil May Cries and all of these, uh, you know, games sort of were influenced by the hack and slashers of the time, it was great to finally not have any reins pulled on us as we played Wolverine. This is a guy that has, you know, adamantium claws that come out of his hands, and you want to use them. They use them in the movies to, you know, pretty decent effect, but you never really saw the blood and guts and gore until Logan. But in the game, it's like, no, man, I want to see it. I want to see the limbs come off. I want to see people cut in two. I want to see that berserk rage that Wolverine has got. And Raven delivered. This is a crazy game to play. And it's definitely one that's worth the throwback, especially if you're a big fan of Logan like I am. X-Men Origins Wolverine, absolutely a buried treasure. We are back and we are starting Let's Play and chat. I've got uh, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite still chipping away at this game. I think I've, I've played a little bit of this on EP Live before. Um, and it's been a lot of Avengers chatting today, lots of superheroes. You know I love my superhero video games. Um, and so I thought I'd play a little bit of this, but I want to hear from you guys. So if you've got questions, I was typing ask away, but I forget you're watching me. So go ahead and ask away. And uh, if you've got any questions, Blake is going to join me. Uh, he's going to pop on and, and he will go through any of the chat stuff here. And if we uh, missed a comment, we'll try to get there. I'm going to try to save this Spider-Man and not let him die. Um, Blake says hello, and we are starting 15 minutes on the clock. What time is it? Yes, we're good. We're good for time. Who, uh, who, who's the other character? Spider-Man and Hawkeye? Uh, uh, Hawkeye versus uh, Black Suit Spider-Man. Okay. Uh, and I'm Spider-Man and Iron Man. And you're going to hear a lot of this, because I do a lot of button mashing when I play fighting games. Uh, but I sure love them, and I, I've always thought this game looks incredible, and I've heard... People like Blair Farrell have told me that this game is super, super fun, and it just keeps getting better and better. I believe that Blair is as big a superhero uh, fanatic as I am. I doubt that. 
Nobody's as big a superhero <laughs> fan as you, Vic. I'm, I am a pretty big superhero uh, fan. Blair is also pointing out in the chat that uh, there's a bunch of costumes on sale right now for this game. So okay, okay. If you, if you have this game and you want some costumes... Now's a good now's time. time to get them. Yeah, they're, get, they're, they're cashing in on the Avengers hype. Um, I, I think I'm going to play this some more and do like a real proper review of the game. I just, uh, I got it. I played some, but I didn't really, and I think I streamed some, but I, I didn't really, uh, I, you know, it just wasn't as good as Injustice. But uh, uh, I think this deserves some, some more real time and I need to play it and uh, get you guys a review. Paul Adamson is asking about Burnout Paradise and... Do you yeah. think that this indicates that EA might be making a sequel down the road? Like yeah, an all-new game? I mean, one can only hope. I, uh, as I said in my review, because you think about the strategic um, uh, reasons why they released it, especially coming on the heels of them saying that they, they're not really into um, remasters. Um, I think they're testing the waters. I think they're... they're uh, respect it came out 10 years ago, so I think they're kind of touting their own internal team at Criterion and probably making those people very happy that worked on that game that are still there, um, seeing how it's going to do financially. Uh, but I also think that there is a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, trying to turn the corner on some of the Battlefront to uh, uh, distaste. And we're going to see some of that. We're going to see a mea culpa, I think, from EA at E3. Um, About the whole loot box thing? Yeah, and I think we're probably going to see them announce a bunch of titles that m maybe would have been surprising from EA over the last couple of years. You mean like more Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, they've been doing that, and we respect that, and, and uh, I'll have a review of A Way Out soon. I'm really looking forward to jumping into that game. That's that's on the uh, that's on my two-play pile. Uh, but... Uh, um, yeah, I think EA is a great game company, and we forget how many great games they've made, and Burnout is one of those franchises. It's silly that we don't have new ones. Um, I think they need to not try to think of every game they make as a billion dollars. I think that was the problem. Like they, yeah. the, some, some financial person at EA said, well, we've got Burnout and we've got Need for Speed. Yeah. Let's, if we're going to invest it, because they look at these things as investments, yeah. they probably looked at Need for Speed as a safer return on investment because more people know the name. Well, you That's know probably what? what happened. Yeah, but you look at a thing like Ready Player One, which we don't know if it's going to be successful or not yet, but you look at something like that, which is loaded to bear with all kinds of pop culture uh, moments and memories. Um, and I, I probably hazard to guess that there aren't that many EA sort of inclusions in that movie. Um, and I think that's a missed opportunity. And how does EA do that well, other well, than... In, like invest in their own properties so that they become pop culture, you know, important pieces of uh, fiction out there. Yeah. You know, like they they had some things that really, you know, crossed over, like The Sims and things like that, and Need for Speed. And the one that comes to my head is uh, Plants vs Zombies, but they just bought that; they didn't make it. Yeah, but they, I mean, it's theirs, right? So yeah. legitimately, it is their thing, and and like Burnout is their thing, and I. The thing I always said about Burnout is that they, they got to, uh, they needed to get to three until it was really unequivocally great. Like you just, anybody that touched that game was like, holy, I remember I got a, a, a nondescript PlayStation 2 disc, to, or play, it was a PlayStation 3 disc. Hang on, I'm just going to go check the audio. Oh, okay. Keep talking. All right. Uh, got this PlayStation 3 disc that didn't even have anything on it. It's just like, here, here's your takedown uh, review thing. And I just could not believe what I played. It was so good. Um, and I feel like games, they need to kind of go through this, this iterative process. And the companies that have these IP... Uh, I, you know, they have to kind of trust in them and let them grow and grow and get better and better. And that's what they did with Burnout. And then it just went away. And that just doesn't make any sense, you know? Like, let it take a breath. That's fine. But to be just completely... Uh, for 10 years, it's it's been kind of gone except for some mobile stuff. It's crazy. You know, and, and then there's also been a bunch, a deluge of Need for Speed games that have tried to capitalize on the... Uh, you know, the billion dollars that uh, Underground made, and, and they really haven't been able to get there. Almost. Do you, do you remember that Need for Speed movie, Vic? 
Yeah, I, I, it was it was <laughs> way Steven better. Spielberg produced. It was way better than the terrible I thought it was going to be. Like it was it was way yeah. more enjoyable than that. I liked Rami Malek was in that movie. He was actually. I, I had fun. high hopes for it. You did? Well, it was produced what? by Steven Spielberg, and the director uh, of it okay. had made that. You were so young then, Blake. The, produ- the director of it had made that that soldier movie, Act of Valor, or something that was really good. Yes, and uh, and, it, and it had Jesse Pinkman in it. Yeah, Jesse Pickman. Uh, Patrick thank, Furtado, thank you so yeah. much, man. Th- thanks, thanks for letting me know thank, about the audio issues. Thanks for the super chat. What, what, I, I, I just was killed it? the game audio. Oh, okay. It, was, it, was, it sounded like a record scratching. It was like, rip, rip, oh, rip, there's rip, some rip. kind of a weird thing going on? Okay. Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. I think it might be a copyright uh, uh, D8, what, what's that, uh, DHCP? Yeah. Through the HDMI on the computer? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Figure it out later. There's, there's, always, there's always stuff with streaming. So there's always stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, there was a good one in here. Let me find it. Oh, yeah. Kevin Wiley wants to know your thoughts on the Nintendo Direct last week. We briefly touched on it, but I don't think you did an actual, like, sit-down discussion about it. Oh, I, I, it's very exciting, and it feels um, uh, like Smash is massive, and we are way before E3. Yeah. Right? So, um, that's exciting, because... It, Smash is massive and also very predictable. We knew it was coming. We also, yeah. uh, you know, speculation is that it's a totally new Smash. It's not just. I think, a I think it's like ninety nine percent confirmed that it is. Yeah. Uh, 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 what's his name? The the Hell Laboratory guy pretty much said it was. Yeah. Because Hell wasn't. We we talked about this in the in the rundown. Hell yeah. wasn't involved in the last one. Okay. And they're credited below the trailer in this one, and Namco, which was involved in the last one, isn't, so it is almost certainly an entirely new game. Okay, well, that's that's big news. Yeah. Uh, and most of the other stuff was fun and cool. I mean, I, I saw that Captain Toad is coming back, but... Uh, I, I, <laughs> Captain Toad? I, you know, like, I feel like there's so much room for these Wii U titles that didn't get any love for them to, like, finally receive some of the love that they deserve. That's cool, but a, a game of that size, that magnitude, to be launched so far before E3, that's telling. That says to me that they've got some really, really big stories coming up. So it was yeah. it was a solid um, Nintendo Direct, predictable that uh, we've got uh, Smash coming, um, but what wasn't said is almost more exciting. You know? What I like is that it shows once again that Nintendo is not resting on their laurels. Mm-hmm. They're not the, the the Switch is a huge hit, but they're still not satisfied. They still want to like get more people buying it. Like they just had their big holiday r- sales rush, and now it's like in March they're like, okay, we want to keep the ball rolling. So what do we do? Oh, we'll announce Smash. Yeah. So I, I like that they're this motivated to keep churning out good games and, yep. and new everything. Like, I think that reads very positively for the future of them as a company. I, I'm super stoked to see how the third-party support starts to build up for this machine. Yeah. You know, like, and to play um, some really great games. I mean, that's uh, that's the thing, like, doing these buried treasures so often like that we're doing is, like, it really becomes clear how many amazing games this industry is sitting on. There's just yeah. so much really good stuff out I, there. I was thinking about that earlier because we did a story about Battlegrounds uh, coming to mobile devices. Yeah. And I was thinking about the Switch because the Switch is not as powerful as the PS4. Right. But it is more powerful than a smartphone. So if you can port a game like Battlegrounds to a smartphone, you can just as easily port it to the Switch. Yeah. So I think we're going to see more of that, more of big games like that coming to the Switch, given its install base. This game is beautiful. Like, this, there's more, there's really going to be... It I want to see this on the Switch. Yeah, it won't be much longer before there's more Switches than there are PS4s and Xbox Ones. So if you're going to port a game to the Xbox One, you would also port it to the Switch. You think? You don't think that there's going to be some major competition on the other side? Like, I, I, I feel like we may see that... that uh, uh, PS, the PS4, P- PS4 uh, on Switch? the go, or whatever they're going to call it. Timber, uh, Timberwolf, that's very nice. Thank you. But I also feel like uh, uh, Xbox, I said this the other day, they, they're taking over LA Live, which is a huge venue right near the, the uh, convention center. It's and, called the Microsoft Theater. That, yeah. Like, the specific screen that they're using, or the yeah, they, theater that they're using? With the, which they just, they like own and they sponsor. Yeah. Um, like, why is not every Microsoft keynote at the Microsoft Theater, right? I think this is going to be a huge thing. Should I should I should I say what I, I'm I'm thinking? 
Yeah, give should I oh, wait? Oh, the prediction you gave yeah. me. It's a crazy prediction. If you want everyone to see it, and then if you're wrong, everyone will know you were wrong. But That's I, okay. I, I no, I, for it. I don't know if we save that for like an E3 prediction idea, like a segment, or I, we just let these wonderful people know. I, I think bit. you've kept them in suspense long enough. Okay, I'm just going to say what, what I'm predicting. This is a crazy prediction. It's crazy. Um, but um, Gabe Newell said games are coming from Valve. The Steam Box bit the dust. It came out and it's dead. The Xbox One X is effectively like it's inches from being an awesome gaming PC that you can plug up to your television. What if Xbox is buying Valve, Half-Life 3 is going to be announced as part of the, the new initiative because Valve's going to be making games. With HTC Vive support on the Xbox. Yes, and then the Xbox will be rebranded to the Steam Box. So and, you and it has Steam built into, into uh, its interface. So you're saying Microsoft is going to buy Valve and then make a whole bunch of awesome Valve games as exclusive to a new Xbox slash Steam machine. And the, and the capper on that prediction, all of this is so utopian, but the capper on that prediction is they will also announce that Steam will be on other platforms and you'll be able to... They'll work it out with PlayStation, and they'll maybe work it out with Nintendo as well. So I could play Half-Life 3 on the Switch. I don't know. <laughs> and, and they'll use streaming technology because they got to kind of compete with the, the onslaught of people being able to stream and buy, uh, um, uh, buy uh, subscriptions to all kinds of stuff. I like this prediction, Vic. It's pretty crazy, right? Know, like it's so it's big, but it's uh, I was like, okay, what if we did the piece that piece that? Because there was a story a few yeah a few months ago they like, were going to buy and yeah, and, and also this huge E three announcement like they are they're they're wanting to change the world here you know they're coming with something they're not just coming with a new Halo you know they're coming with something. I mean, everybody's getting into content creation now, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Microsoft starts buying film studios and stuff like that. Well, they did I, that before. I guess before. they tried that before. Yeah, yeah. but maybe, I, I think they, they went about it thinking that film was better than games in a way, you know, and maybe spent more money than they could really kind of justify Yeah. because the film industry is very good at being expensive um, <laughs> and more mature at being expensive yeah. than the video game space is. Uh, but I, I feel like they can see that games we're always going to be playing video games you know we'll always have a screen we will always be playing video games and microsoft is not going away from that so the only way that they stay in the market and can succeed is if they they go harder at it you know and something like that could be huge and the other thing that makes me think that is gabe newell used to work at uh, microsoft as far as I know, it's not a public company or shaping yeah, up to Val, be a public Val company. Valve isn't a public company, no. It's probably so not. instead of them growing to the st size and stature of them wanting to go public, why don't they just go with one of the most established public companies yeah. and let their shareholders and their uh, and geographically their they're, board. They're, they're right next to the Microsoft campus. Yeah. Right? They're in yeah. Redmond, right? So I don't know. That's a cra that's my crazy. Uh, it's my crazy idea. Uh, Doy Owen says, "Keep dreaming." Uh, if it, John hey, Hitbox if it, if it says, an, somebody get me a towel. Reality. I don't know what the hell John Hitbox is talking about. If it makes a new Half-Life a reality, hey, I don't care. Yeah. I'm, I'm all for it. Just anything that gets Valve making games again, yeah. like that would be great. I mean, wouldn't that be smart on yeah. everybody's part to do that? Right? Like, I don't see what the the real negative about that would be, especially if, Nint if um, um, Microsoft says... They probably wouldn't want to support Linux. But honestly, they'd be making money there too, right? That's the thing, is that they'd, they'd, make, they'd make money well, on the Mac, they'd make money everywhere. Wasn't anti-Linux Steve Ballmer's thing yeah. at Microsoft? And he's gone, so maybe they maybe they will? Mondo Blasto. I, I, I didn't really talk about it being dead in the water because the news just kind of evaporated, you know? Like, every console since uh, we started at EP, like, people have built them and then they've figured out how to get them to us and the other, you know, um, reviewers and the other outlets out there. And there was a little bit of a murmur when the Steam boxes started to happen, and then it just stopped, you know, and nobody sent us a Steam box. And, yeah, the Steam box know. is, I mean, you never hear about the Steam box. That's how you know it's not a big deal anymore, you know? Yeah, Timberwolf like, says how many he wants people, his Steam library on his Xbox One. But how many people out there have a Steam box? Yeah. Everybody has Steam. How many of you have a Steam box? 
Well, you know what? Probably not very many. You, you look at the Digital Foundry, um, look at the 4K up version of the original uh, Burnout uh, compared to the Xbox One X, and the Xbox One X just trounces it, and, it, and it's... Yeah, it's not the exact same code for code, but like the Xbox One X is a really competent machine that could be flipped to be much more than it is, you know? And that's also why Microsoft can't announce a new Xbox now. Not this year. Yeah. Next year, maybe. But then they're, if Sony comes up with an intimation that they've got a, a new machine, then they're, they're a year behind, which they cannot be. Yeah. You know? One, one thing, one prediction I will make for E3 is that Microsoft will announce um, VR support on the Xbox One. Yes. So you'll be able to plug in uh, Windows Mixed Reality headsets. You mean on the Steam Box? No, on the on the Xbox One X. <laughs> on on the, the Steam Box the X. X. Maybe the first <laughs> launch Xbox won't be able to do it, but <laughs> like, yeah, HEC Vive, Oculus Rift, and uh, Windows MR headsets will they'll announce support for it at E3. Well, if they call it the Steam Box, it also would solve a major uh, naming issue or branding issue that they have with with uh, Xbox One because it's really hard to think of what the next Xbox is going to be called when you start with Xbox One, unless you call it Xbox Two. I guess you could just go that literal, but that just seems... It's called the Xbox. Let's <laughs> call it that. Just the X. I thought that's what they were going to do with this thing. Okay, um, bye, everyone. Okay. <laughs> uh, that gives you something to think about over the weekend there. Thank you all for joining us live. And if you're watching the archive of this, thank you so much for uh, checking out EP Live. We do uh, record them um, uh, as often as we possibly can. And we are coming back on Monday uh, with a brand new EP Live for you. I don't know exactly what's going into the show just yet, but we'll let you know. And uh, we also have a new uh, classic episode of EP going up over the weekend. You guys rock. Thank you so much. Remember, we've got tons of content for you to check out. If uh, you do check it out and you do like it, please hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit that little bell. And if you're so inclined, that sponsorship button too. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend.